The Lord be with you. Welcome to this Ascension Sunday at Westminster Online. It's great to have you with us today. You'll notice that we are not in the sanctuary uh, at Westminster. Maybe you saw the WGRZ uh, image of Westminster announcing uh, that the governor has given uh, his approval for churches to gather, to congregate uh, in numbers of 10 or less. Uh, we're not there today. Uh, that was simply a stock photo that uh, this TV station was using to make that announcement. But I will take this opportunity to tell you uh, that we won't be opening anytime soon. Uh, we are uh, observing the uh, strictest precautions. Uh, our opening of the, uh, of the church and the campus uh, will take place uh, in stages. Uh, safety first. Uh, we are indeed talking about that process and uh, when and how it will happen. There's no date as of now, and uh, I don't anticipate a date being set for some time. Today, following the worship service, there will be a meet and mingle. I hope you can join us. Uh, this is a delightful time, just like meet and mingle in the homes room. Email uh, Sari Becker so that she can uh, ensure that you participate in that fellowship time following worship today. I hope you've been enjoying Homes at Home. The last one will occur this coming Tuesday at 6.30. Uh, the Dr. Uh, Jennifer Reed, a professor at the SUNY UB, uh, a psychologist, will talk with us about um, uh, alcohol and substance abuse during the pandemic. Uh, also the impact that that uh, this pandemic is having on things like domestic violence. Uh, it will be a fascinating presentation by a member of our congregation and an expert in these areas. Next week is Pentecost, the birthday of the church. The Reverend Beth Hennessy will be the preacher. Welcome to this worship service. Shout for joy, sing songs of praise, for God reigns over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout. Sound the trumpet, sing songs of praise. Let us worship God.
Let us pray. O Lord, we wait for you, and in your word we trust. By the power of your Spirit, set our hearts and minds on the source of life and peace. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our Gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 44 to 53. Listen for the word of God. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. May thy word be spoken, O God, and may it be thy word that is heard for Jesus' sake. Amen. I say Dingus Day. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Go ahead, raise your hand. Full disclosure, I can never quite remember what that sacred Polish holiday means. I know it has something to do with Easter, but that's where my memory fades and mystery takes over. Ascension Day, which is always the last Thursday of Eastertide, but we celebrate it on the last Sunday of Eastertide, which is today, like Dingus Day, is hidden behind the veil of the almost but not quite familiar. But don't worry. By the end of this sermon, you will know everything you need to know about this strange but important Christian festival. There are two ways to talk about the Ascension. The first is what it does. Ascension Day solves the problem, as one commentator bluntly said, of what to do with the body of Jesus. It goes to heaven. Hence the phrase in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. But solving that problem creates another problem. If Jesus is in heaven, he is no longer with his disciples. Thus, enter the Holy Spirit, who Jesus said he would send after his departure. While these three parts of the Trinitarian God taking their places in the theology of the early church may be obvious to us, it was not so obvious to that first generation. There was no such thing as the Trinity, as an official doctrine of the Church, until the Council of Nicaea in 325. But now that Jesus is at God's right hand, Jesus can reign with God and provide God with another persona. And when the Holy Spirit, who Jesus promised would come in his absence, makes its debut at Pentecost, the whole superstructure of the Christian Godhead is now in place just 50 days after the resurrection. Here's what Paul says. If Jesus did not ascend to be with God, then Jesus wasn't God. And if Jesus wasn't God, then our teaching is in vain and we are the most to be pitied. But if Jesus did ascend, then all the things that we claim about the power of life and love conquering sin and death are true. And we, who are victims of our own sinfulness, are given our lives back over and over. The other way to talk about the Ascension is in terms of what it makes possible. Jesus' disciples, you and I, receive new life, that this risen ascended to the right hand of God, second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, makes possible. Luke's account of the Ascension describes Jesus going up, 
to the right hand of God. His account repeats what I'm calling the cadence of salvation or the cadence of new life. And before he ends his gospel, this is in the 24th chapter, just before the finish, it's as if Luke is saying, if you remember anything, remember this, the cadence of salvation are the steps to new life. We are saved, sent, and blessed. In today's lesson, the disciples encounter the risen Christ. He shows them the wounds in his side, his hands, and his feet. He asks for a fish, which he eats before them. This Jesus is real. No figment of their memory or ghost or production of their imagination. Luke says Jesus opens their minds. He did what he did with those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He connects all the dots of biblical history and his very special place in that history. He talks about God's plan to free the human family from sin and death through his uh, death and resurrection. Remember, the disciples need all the help they can get. So he does this important uh, moment of teaching before the ascension. And then he tells them that because they are witnesses to these things, that he will send them into the world to tell his story and bring salvation to others, for which he gives them his blessing. Saved, sent, blessed. And then he ascends. Now that Jesus is at the right hand, we are to carry out his work in the world. If you have been saved by God's good news of new life through the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus, if you are a witness in your own life to Christ's saving power, then you become one who is sent to share that good news with others. There's no debate. Of course you're going to take that life-saving good news to those who have never heard it or need to hear it again. Here's an example, LeBron James. Some say that he is the greatest basketball player of all time. Maybe you saw him the other night. He was the host of the national, nationally televised uh, celebration for the class of 2020 high school students uh, for which uh, Barack Obama was the keynote speaker. LeBron grew up and went to school in Akron, Ohio. He never left Akron. What he has done is to build a kindergarten through eighth grade school that will give at-risk kids like he was, who suffer like he did from a very unstable home life, the supports they need to get an education. LeBron knows that without the teachers and the support that he received, he never would have made it to the NBA. He considers the founding of this school as the most important thing he has accomplished in his life. And if you asked him if he feels blessed today, I'll bet he would say something like, giving those kids a chance to live beyond their teenage years with an education that they can build a life around is why he was blessed with his skill at basketball in the first place. Or Barack Obama who in his bid for an Illinois state Senate seat said, I stand here knowing that my story is part of a larger American story, that I owe a debt to all of those who came before me and that no other country on earth would my story be possible. What did he do? He and Michelle founded the Obama Leadership Center that teaches young people to become leaders just like he was given the opportunity to learn how to become a leader. So these young people now will become leaders and will build their communities and shape the nation. There are countless stories. When I was growing up in Pittsburgh, we went to the local Carnegie Library. We learned that Mr. Carnegie, who immigrated to this country as a poor Scots with his family, became one of the wealthiest people in the world when he founded the United States Steel Company and it grew to great uh, stature. Carnegie built and funded 4,000 libraries in the United States, Canada, Scotland, and several other countries. 
He credited the generosity of a Pittsburgh leader who, when he was a boy, a working boy, as he said, made available to him and to his friends this man's personal library on Saturday mornings. Carnegie said that it gave him the knowledge to improve himself and to become a great industrialist. One educator said that Carnegie's libraries, built just at the turn of the 20th century, literally transformed the United States into a literate society. When your life has been changed by some intervention of a person or organization or scholarship, without which your circumstances would have been dire, if not disastrous, you learn two things, empathy and gratitude. Empathy for those who face hardships that you once faced, and gratitude for the help you got that saved your life. And when your life has been changed, when you've been given a new life, you can't help but share with others what it was that you received that made all the difference. It's the same knowing love and care in the presence of Jesus in your life. You want others to have that same reassurance, that same strength and peace in the midst of turmoil, that same power. Has Jesus, God of the Holy Spirit, changed your life? Most of us could point to such moments when we were made better than ourselves, stronger than we knew we could be, and it made all the difference. It doesn't matter what we call that power. What matters is that we are open to it, we received it, and let it change our lives. One of the first times I had such an experience was in high school. It was my pastor who led a very large and active Presbyterian church in Pittsburgh who found time on Saturday mornings to meet with a good friend and me to read the Bible. We were both asking questions, my friend and I, about our faith and about life, and we turned to the Bible for answers. Bill Barker was a Greek and Hebrew scholar, and he would walk us through his off-the-cuff translations of the original texts and point out the range and variety of readings that could be made of them. The Bible study was important, but what I remember is Reverend Barker's gracious, patient, generous friendship. He was the embodiment for me of how a follower of Jesus was supposed to act. I thought we were studying the Bible, but really, my friend and I were given the opportunity to be close observers of a Christian life in action, which, as I look back on it, is really the question that we were asking. What is a Christian? At that point, shortly after I'd lost my father and my mother remarried and we'd moved to this new community, Reverend Barker gave me the ability to trust what I said at my confirmation a few years before, when other things that I believed in were taken away or didn't hold up, Reverend Barker reassured me that my faith could never be taken away. At a turning point in my life, that made all the difference. Our witness to the saving grace of God is possible because Jesus is who he said he was. The one who suffered, died, and was raised, and who has ascended into heaven. The one who is present to us, with people, through people, for people. Paul is right. If Jesus didn't ascend, then our faith is in vain and we are to be pitied. But he did rise to new life. And he did ascend to the right hand of God, and he does reign over the just and the unjust. These are not theories to be proved. They are the language of faith, propositions to trust and live by. John Ruskin, that remarkable British writer, painter, environmentalist, and historian of <clears throat> art and architecture, commenting on a painting by Giotto of the Ascension, was perplexed that such a significant event in Christian history and doctrine didn't get more attention, like the Nativity or the Crucifixion. The Ascension, Ruskin said, as a non-believer, seems an afterthought by theologians and artists. 
But without it, Christ and his place in our faith and practice would be no more than a wise man and great teacher. There are plenty of wise men and great teachers in the world. There is one risen Christ who makes all things new, including you and me, even after we have fallen or questioned our faith like I did back in the 10th grade and more than a few times since, or like perhaps you have in some moment of despair or crisis. Thank goodness for the Bill Barkers of the world who have been saved, sent, and blessed. Thank goodness that you and I have been saved, sent, and blessed for this work. We're living in a pandemic. The world has changed. Jobs have been lost. Loved ones have died. People are searching for something that can be trusted and won't change. There's no greater gift that we could give than the faith that holds us up and makes all things new, even when the world seems to be falling apart. Amen.
Brett Martin, organist and director of music here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Now more than ever, it is so important to maintain your pledge to our 2020 generosity campaign. Westminster has committed to maintaining both its church and school staff, even though we're all working from home, trying to fight this crisis that we find ourselves in. There are two ways you can continue your pledge to Westminster. The first is to mail a check here to the church, 724 Delaware Avenue, Buffalo, New York, 14209. The second way is to use our secure website. Go to wpcbuffalo.org. Over here on the right, you'll see a link to giving. Click on that. Click on 2020 Annual Giving Campaign. It'll take you to the next page where you click Submit a Payment. On the next page, you'll enter your amount for your annual giving donation. You'll be prompted to enter a security code that will show on the screen. When you click continue, that will take you to the next page where you will input your credit or debit card information. When you finish this page, a receipt will automatically sent to your email. Thank you again for maintaining your annual gift and pledges to our generosity campaign here at Westminster during these times. As we go to prayer this morning, I invite you to join me in saying after each petition, we pray to you, good Lord. Let us join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, your might upholds the cosmos and your mercy sustains the universe. To you we lift our prayers that the church be enlivened to be the body of Christ, that we lead with visionary wisdom and be witnesses to your mercy and love. We pray to you, good Lord, that the earth be preserved from disastrous climate, that animals and their young be safeguarded, that the trees and bushes be protected for their fruit and beauty. We pray to you, good Lord, that wars between nations and violence within each population cease, that the leaders of nations enact justice for their people, and that legislators be granted wisdom for their difficult decisions. We pray to you, good Lord, that those with coronavirus be healed, that those facing death be comforted, that those returning to society remain healthy, that health care workers and caregivers be granted endurance, that hospitals be equipped for their work, that researchers discover a vaccine, and that further waves of illness be averted. We pray to you, good Lord, that the poor be fed, clothed, and housed, that the unemployed find jobs, the grieving and lonely be consoled, that those facing illness, injury, or addiction find hope and healing. We pray to you, good Lord, that our private sorrows and joys now be welcomed by you. On this Memorial Day weekend, O oh God, we remember and give thanks for those women and men who gave the ultimate sacrifice of their lives in service to our country. O oh God, in you we live and move and have our being. Receive our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for us. In his name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.
And now may the glory of God fill you with praise. May the beauty of Christ strengthen you in service. And may the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with peace. Amen.